Kia ora, talofa, haere mai, and welcome to today's episode of the Niche Cage, a variety show where we touch on a couple different ideas, a couple different things, bits and pieces from the Aotearoa sporting landscape on behalf of the Niche Cage. We are here to broadcast Aotearoa sporting excellence and offer a bit of uh, funk and keep it a full steak and cheese pie. That's what we do every day. We just live it up with Aotearoa sports. Early in the week, we record a big old Patreon podcast. That's for Mondays. So if you are a member of the Patreon whānau, make sure you check that out. And patreon.com forward slash EL niche cache is the best way to support the niche cache. Patreon.com forward slash L niche cache. Extra podcasts there, as well as other bits and pieces and just ideas floating around between us and the Patreon Fano. So if you do appreciate this content, do join the Patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash L niche cache every Monday. And Friday, we also deliver an email banger via Substack, the nichecase.substack.com. And this is where we produce all sorts of funky yarns. I dropped a little nugget about there being two halves from Aotearoa aligned with NRL clubs, both by the name of Cassius. Cassius Cowley, who I think is from Tokoroa. He is in the Wynnum Manly system, which is loosely affiliated to the Broncos. And there's also Cassius Tia, who is from Auckland Marist Saints Jr. He is in the Roosters system. Wildcard went deep on Liberato Kakache, playing in the Serie A as well. So every Monday and Friday, the email banger is full of niche cage content, the podcast, links to our uh, yarns that we write, and also bonus content, extra yarns every Monday and Friday evening thenichecache.substack.com and of course big in-depth yarns uh, today I published who is using what bats which is always an interesting summer activity breaking down the batting equipment of Aotearoa's black caps in the test team so there's always in-depth yarns there's a big old flying kiwis yarn big old football ferns debrief as well at thenichecache.com so check that out and big it up to everyone who reads our shit and absorbs the mana from Aotearoa via the niche cash. We always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness wildcard. What do you got? What have I got? This comes from Mr. Blaise Pascal, who is a, or was, um, a, an old-timey, I, I think, mathematician. I think he's the dude who gave us um, Pascal's, Pascal's Triangle, I think it's called. Um, this fella. Also, one said, nature is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. So a lot of math going on there. So I'm not too good at the old uh, mathematics. So Pascal. A little bit of geometry, yeah. But a center, bit. but a circumference, but a everywhere, but a nowhere. How do you interpret that one? Why did you share it with us? Well, I picked it up in a, um, I was reading a, Jorge Luis Boyhe's book, um, old mate from Argentina, short story writer, I think, and I think, I think it's a bit of poetry as well. Um, Clever Mind, who's one of those guys that's always on those lists of like writers that you should read. And so I was reading one um, and that was mentioned in the introduction as, as being something like, I can't remember what the link was, but um, that's where I found it. And yeah, it's... <laughs> He does bring in the old, like, the spheres and the circumferences and the centers and stuff. I guess it's like, it's like if you've asked a, a sports person to explain something about the world, they'd probably find a sporting metaphor. So a mathematician's going to find a mathematical metaphor. Makes sense. Um, but, like, nature is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. Um, the circumference, obviously, being the outside of the circle. So, like, there are no boundaries. It, and yet the center is everywhere like wherever wherever you point to that's the middle of the world like that's the middle of the universe um it just sounds to me like one of those uh, um uh just like, like a western version of a of a buddhist idea of just like you know if everything is everywhere and um there there isn't like uh what's well i can't remember what that word is exactly that i'm trying to get at but like um it's all encompassed in everything well, it's, it, 
limitless this is the problem I'm trying to I'm trying to explain what it means to be limitless it's like well you can't because there's no limits to define it by right it's the it's the issue um the center of the sphere the center of the universe is absolutely everywhere um therefore there can't be a circumference I suppose I don't know it just sounds nice and evocative it's nice uh everything is everything well no boundaries to nature means there's no limit to nature right so yeah, you can no boundaries, it, no limits. Exactly. You can interpret it that way. There's nothing, there's no limit to what nature can do. And when you realize that every little thing is the center of nature, then you start to realize the limitless nature of nature. Because mm. the little fly, the bee, the bird, the tree, whatever the fuck it is, the humans, if you think about them as the center of the natural world, then you're getting you're tapping into the boundless nature of what is possible in our nature that we experience here on planet earth let's crack into the show here and Welcome. also the the lack of hierarchy right like the fly the is as nature, important yeah. as the human etc yep cool hot takes wildcard let's get into this show i'm gonna go hot takey you're gonna go palm crack in with your palm let's go my palm colin de grand home colin de grand home Colin de Grandum, Colin de Grand Dome. However you want to pronounce it, he doesn't care. He just cracks leather. Beauty. Using his SS Tun Sunridges Retro Bat. That's the, the only one. Uh, black cap, I believe, using an SS Bat. There was a moment where Jeet Raval, BJ Watling, and de Grand Home were all using Kookaburra. Then they changed to SS which resulted in Jeet Raval and de Grandhom dropping out of the Black Caps test team. BJ Walling retired. Colin de Grandhom comes back, hits 100 with an SS. Sunridge's retro bat. Booyakasha. My hot take here, Wildcat, is I've been incredibly tapped into both of these sports and both of these teams over recent years. And I am getting distinctly 2017 Aotearoa Kiwis Rugby League World Cup vibrations from the white fence there are similarities as far as playing world cups in aotearoa obviously the cricket one coming up is solely hosted in aotearoa back in 2017 the rugby league world cup was co-hosted between aotearoa and australia um, but both teams lost a lot of games prior to the world cup both teams had red flags evident in their preparation and at the time, back in 2017, I ignored those red flags until the very last moments of uh, their World Cup capitulation. And I am sensing a lot of the same energy from the White Ferns. So now I'm putting what I learned from the 2017 World Cup and applying it for this White Ferns and their World Cup. And I'm just getting the same vibe, same energy. And I'm obviously curious how that plays out over the course of this World Cup. But think about all the weird, wonky, niggly, icky, yucky shit that happened with the Aotearoa Kiwis since David Kidwell took over to when they um, were bundled out of the World Cup. Losses, weird coaching, weird selections, bad energy, bad mana, Tongans, flipping their eligibility, losing games that you should never have lost. There was all there. And right now, again, the same vibe from the white fence. So I'm fascinated to see how that plays out and check back in later with my interpret interpretation of those two vibrations that feel similar. Statistical glory here, wildcard. We tap into some key statistics to invigorate and enlighten us with Aotearoa sport. What do you got? I've got some Stephen Adams stuff here. So there was a game back in November, Memphis Grizzlies against the Minnesota Timberwolves. Most people, especially most people who care about Stephen Adams and the Memphis Grizzlies, will have forgotten about this game. That's because the Wolves won in a blowout. Um, one by 43 points. Stephen Adams actually only played 17 minutes. It was one of those ones where they lost so quickly that they raced all the starters. This is before they sort of flipped the switch um, and suddenly became amazing back in their sort of like nine and 10 or whatever it was start to the season. The reason I mentioned this game, the reason it's notable is because this was the only game all season in which Stephen Adams 
did not get an offensive rebound. He's had 35 games out of, I think he's up to 58 or something like that, matches played. He missed a couple when he went into COVID protocols. Um, uh, he's 35 games overall where in which he's had at least four offensive rebounds. He has 28 games with at least five offensive rebounds. He has 11 games with eight or more offensive rebounds this season. There are only 24 players in the entire NBA who have had an eight-plus offensive rebound game, and nobody else has more than five. Again, Stephen Adams has 11 of them. Um, he has 265 offensive boards in total, which is miles out ahead of Mitchell Robinson from the Knicks, who's second with 208, um, with an OREB percentage of 17.9. He is also miles ahead of Rudy Gobert, who at 12.7% is second, and it's not even close there. <laughs> it's, it's so far ahead that he doesn't even that stat doesn't even look real. Um, and so unsurprisingly, when you consider that, also his 4.6 offensive boards per game, uh, comfortably a league best as well. I actually did the stat a couple months ago, um, sort of establishing the fact that Stephen Adams was and is the best offensive rebounder in the NBA. The reason I'm coming back to it now is because not only is it still the case, but <laughs> it's not even close anymore. Like he's stretching out the lead. He, he was already the best, and now he's better than he was before when he was already the best. And just quietly, uh, he's averaging a sneaky little 9.8 points, 12.1 rebounds, 4.8 assists, shooting 63.8% from the field for the month of February, playing arguably his best ball of the season right now. And it's pretty much like it's must-watch television whenever the Grizzlies are playing at the moment. Like Steven Adams is just on fire. The team is playing fantastic, and I cannot wait until the playoffs. <sighs> Hold that thought while well, Carter got a good question for Ooh, you later yeah. on in this show. My statistic, I just want to highlight of the 17 players who played for the Newcastle Knights Wahine team that lost by one point to Parramatta Eels in the NRLW competition. Six of them are from Aotearoa. We've got Caitlin Vahaakolu starting on the wing. Autumn Rain, Stevens Daly started in the halves. Crystal Rota started at hooker. Aneta Nuasala started at prop. Shante Poco started at lock and Charlotte Scanlon came off the bench. Shout out to my tour Federica as well. She was 18th woman. Um, so that is six players out of 17 in the Knights lineup that are straight out of Aotearoa. As well as highlighting a rather impressive stat line here from Amber Hall, who was the only... Yes, only player from Aotearoa in the uh, Broncos Wahine team. And in 44 minutes, Amber Hall, she was from Auckland, plays on an edge, very powerful runner and very skillful player, which I'm about to relay that information to you. 44 minutes, 11 runs, 101 meters. So just under that 10 meter per run mark, four tackle bus, two one-on-one -on -one steals, four offloads, and 24 tackles at 96%. She didn't have the most tackles for the Broncos. Millie Boyle had 27 tackles, but she only tackled at 90%. And they were the only Broncos forwards to ta have over 20 tackles. So Amber Hall had 24 tackles at 96%, which is bloody impressive when you're playing on an edge. To have that many tackles means you're busy getting the mahi done defensively and one of the most uh, relevant visions I have about uh, NRLW since its inception last few seasons, last few years, is Amber Hall running the footy. She is a beast. She's got great offload. Also a nifty stealer, by the, apparently. And she gets everything done. So keep an eye on Amber Hall with the Broncos. And of course, if you are looking for an NRLW team to support, can't go past the quantity and quality of the Aotearoa Wahine Knights. Deep in the mangroves wild card, there's a certain lad playing a bit of footy in Italy, uh, uh, apparently. Apparently, yeah. It is, uh, definitely apparently. Um, it was very apparent watching Empoli versus Juventus on the weekend that the fella, if you're watching this on YouTube, the fella behind over my shoulder, resplendent in his turtleneck there. Uh, with the mask as well. I was looking sharp in the backpack. Um, he 
what like Libby Kikache is obviously who I'm talking about. Um, given his starting debut for Empoli, his third appearance for them in Serie A, and his starting debut against Juventus, um, no less. And I'm just going a little bit deeper in the mangroves on what he did, like how he played, what how he um how he showed up. If you check the highlights, it's not too flash because you'll notice um you'll notice Moise Kane winning a header for the first Juve goal um down his side, which maybe he could have done a little bit more with, maybe not. Um, center back was in the area as well, not so much his fault, but you definitely will notice that he was out of position for the next two goals that Juventus scored. Um, one in stoppage time of the first half, and one then one sort of like midway through the second half. Um, that doesn't look too flash. Just looking at the highlights package, if you watch the game further back, which I've actually watched the game twice. I watched it through once and then I watched it through again to clip out the highlights because I was going to put together a, like a compilation of just all his touches, all his major involvements throughout the game, which I did do. Um, but the bastards at YouTube wouldn't let me upload it because it hit the old copyright red flag. So I chucked that one up on a Google Drive. And if you read our Substack mailer from, from Monday, where I go into a lot of these same ideas, then you can find a link in there. Um, he the reason he was out of position for both those two goals was because he was pushed and fought. Like this is Kakache trying to do what he does and a couple of nice little like one twos and stuff, trying to trying to advance the ball. Like and the first thing you notice about him watching these games, well, the first thing you notice watching him play is that despite it being like top flight in Italy, he physically does not look out of place. Like he's holding his own there on that side of things. Um, pretty good positionally on the whole. But as I say, a couple moments where he got caught out there for gold. Um, but what the next thing you notice is that he's he's trying to advance the ball. Like he's getting the ball. He's not looking to play safe. He's looking for a forward option um, as his first instinct. Like that that stands out. That all bode well. Um, that's also why he's trying to get some of these runs, one twos up the line, overlapping situations. It's also how both those two goals ended up with him out of position though. Um, one, he does a, like a lovely little one, two, and then feeds it back into the middle to his midfielder. It's his stoppage time in the first half. They've just equalized to make it one all. Midfielder does something stupid and tries to play a perfect pass straight to a uh, Juventus midfielder. Juve counterattack before Libby can get back and uh, Dusan Vlahovic scores. Um, and he also scored the second one as well, which again, like similar situation, but um, Empoli were proper on attack this time, trying to get up the left wing. Kakache makes an overlapping run. Winger doesn't use him, cuts inside, chips it to the far post. Far post, Juventus are able to clear it, counterattack. Murata gets the ball on halfway, carries it forward. Um, Kakache sprinting back now. He's made an overlapping run almost to the byline. He's going to make like an 80 meter sprint to get back. Almost gets there. Actually might have been able to get a challenge on Vlahovic. Um, had there not been just like the sexiest, perfect um, first touch from Vlahovic, um, this is it's, it's so good. That dude, they spent about 80, like 80 million euros on him in January um, from Fiorentina, and he's a fantastic striker. Um, scored, uh, scored a double on this one. So, like, Kakache was almost there in recovery to stop him. Didn't quite. Therefore, every replay that you watch is him being held off by the dude with like the perfect first touch to stick, like keep his body between the ball and the defender and then finishing nicely. So, um, Kakaji then got subbed off soon after on about 70 minutes. Uh, Fabiano Parisi came on in place of him, who is the guy he had been coming on in place of for his first couple um, appearances. So these two are sort of alternating at left back, similar ages, both prospects, both there on loan at the moment as well. Um, Parisi put in a cross that ended up leading it to a, to another goal for Empoli, but um, and you know it lo looked pretty good. Like he gave them a bit of um, bit of energy off the bench, but we're focusing on Kikache here, and I think overall Kikache's extra defensive nous, um certainly stands out. He had an eighty nine point two percent passing success rate in this game, which is pretty excellent. Um, like all these things, it's, it was a standard kind of game from him. It wasn't a game where if you weren't looking for him, you would notice him necessarily. But if you are looking for him and you were like aware of the fact that this was his first start at this level, that he's been moved like two years ago, he wasn't playing against Juventus. He was playing against like Central Coast Mariners. You know, if you're aware of that kind of progression, then for this to be like his first start, I think there was a lot of evidence there that he's, he's, he's comfortable at this level and like he will need to offer more an attack part of that is about getting his teammates also to involve him because as i say like a mean overlapping run and then just getting ignored and then you get scored against on the counter attack 
um, doesn't look too flash. And there was a few instances of that, like their left center back was quite left footed, didn't really like passing, opening his body that to, to that side. So little things like that, where he's got to integrate a little bit more and that'll come naturally with more games. But I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited from what I've seen from him so far. And I think like 70 minutes there against Juventus was pretty bloody impressive considering where he's come from and how quickly he's done it. Quick follow-up question, like, we're great at offering the context and the depth here, but I'm going the opposite direction. I literally only want you to list names that come to your mind in your flying Kiwis realm who are funkier than Kikache right now. Done. No one. <laughs> there's your list. I mean, there's a few on a similar no, level. Okay, like I think okay. Rhea Percival, Chris Wood, Joe Bell, the, that kind of thing, that's your top tier. But there's no one that comes to mind as like gives you the same buzz, gives you the same. I need to watch this dude play because fucking he's right up there with Kikache. Like Kikache is top tier. He's sniffing around yeah. the top of the funkiest flying Kiwis, is what you're telling us. Yeah, I'd put those four there. Like it's part of it is also because Bell and um Bell and uh, Kikache are at new clubs, so there's like a there's a fresh interest there of seeing how they fit in, learning about this new team kind of thing. But yeah, there's your top tier. I mean, he's this is like one of the top leagues in Europe. It, it doesn't get much higher than that. There's higher honours in, in, in the world of cricket than a Ford Trophy Championship and a Halle Burton Johnston Shield Championship. But in the realms of domestic cricket, they don't get much more funky. Other than like Plunkett Shield, Halle Burton Johnston Shield is the premier women's competition. Plunkett Shield for the men. We'd love to see some uh, four-day cricket for the Wahine domestic cricketers at some point as well. But my deep in the mangroves here, wildcard, I'm just going to offer some key notes about Auckland's team that won the Ford Trophy over the weekend and Otago, who won the Halliburton and Johnston Shield. If you think about Auckland, all I need to say for batting stuff is they've got George Worker, Martin Guptill, Mark Chapman, and Glenn Phillips. Like, if you've got those dudes in a one-day team, you're going to go pretty well. And funnily enough, they were their leading run scorers. So no surprise there. The key thing is that Lockie Ferguson in the Ford Trophy took 14 wickets and an average of 14 after taking 17 wickets and an average of 16 in the Super Smash. So Lockie Ferguson is a motherfucking beast. Key thing. Also, shout out to Will Summerford. Cheeky eight wickets at 21 in the Super Smash, followed it up with 11 wickets at an average of 34 in the Ford Trophy. So maybe Will Somerville's test career is not over yet. Who knows? I don't know. But Will Somerville is doing a fantastic job of helping develop Aditya Ashok. His stats aren't so significant here. 11 wickets and an average of 38 in the Ford Trophy after 14 wickets and an average of 17 in the Super Smash. So with Ashok, He's taken wickets with the white ball in his first season of domestic cricket. Interested to see what happens with him in the Plunkett Shield if he does play moving forward because they do have Will Somerville holding it down. And Will Somerville, dad, he can, you know, he's, a, he's the elder statement, statesman, statesman of the Auckland team, which is good for him. He's ticking along. But his role in guiding Ashok, I think, is crucial Otherwise, it's all about Lockie Ferguson and his uh, mahi snaring big wickets, as well as that batting quartet, because three of them are around the fringe of various Black Caps formats, and George Worker is certainly reminding us that he is still a pretty good one-day batsman as well. Move over to Otago Sparks, and... It's a similar vibe. So you've got the four batters for Auckland, and then you've got the one batter for Otago in Kate Ibrahim. She is top five for one-day runs in Aotearoa um, in her last four seasons. She averaged 75, and she has averaged over 60 in each of these seasons. And she hit a 96 in this final, I believe. I don't think it was a 96, but she passed 50, and she had five 50s in seven innings. So she scored a 50 most of her innings in the Halle Burton Johnston Shield. But again, like Auckland, I'm going to look to the bowling unit 
for where the real funk is here. Because we know Kate Ibrahim is one of the best, if not the best one day batter in Aotearoa. And the best bowlers for Otago were Eden Carson, the uh, young offie. 14 wickets and an average of 11. And this comes after a Super Smash campaign where she took 17 wickets and an average of 15. Then we also must look towards Seema Emma Black. She took 13 wickets and an average of 13 in the HBJ Shield. Go back to the Super Smash, funnily enough, 16 wickets and an average of 19 for Emma Black. So Emma Black and Eden Carson dominated the Super Smash as young bowlers, one with spin, one with seam, and then they dominated the HBJ competition as well. Sophie Oldershaw was also decent in the Super Smash and the Halliburton Johnston Shield. Um, and then there's just a bunch of uh, young Otago bowlers who all chimed in as well. Didn't see much of Molly Lowe. She was great in the Super Smash. Wasn't um, as busy in the HBJ Shield. So those are the key figures in Otago's HBJ Shield Championship victory, as well as Auckland's Ford Trophy Championship. Obviously, women's cricket in Aotearoa now moves towards the World Cup. Blokes cricket in Aotearoa wrap up this test series versus South Africa, ODIs against the Dutch, and Plunkett Shield. Pretty cool little phase coming up there. Let's get question time here, Wildcard. I'm going to ask you in relation to Stephen Adams, and we've had the, uh, the also, Sean Marks, doing a bit of mahi with the Brooklyn Nets in recent weeks as well. Both teams have a case an argument for a positive trajectory over the next few weeks as we move to the back end of the NBA season. And I'm going to ask you, who has a better finish to the NBA season, the Memphis Grizzlies with Stephen Adams or the Brooklyn Nets with Sean Marks? And obviously their various roles within that system are pretty clear, pretty known. So I just want to ask you, who has the better finish to the NBA season with Stephen Adams and the Grizzlies, Sean Marks or the Nets and the Nets? Yeah, um, that's that's an interesting one because I could see a way in which it's like pretty touch and go for the rest of the regular season in terms of the respective records. But um, that would be on the back of Memphis having been like unstoppable for at least two months and Brooklyn having just come through a month where they've had so many injuries and unavailabilities that they've you know plummeted from hoping to I mean they come into the season they would have been expecting to be a top two seed um, they're probably going to have to play a play-in game to get there and I worry about what that means for them as like they're they're a team that no one's going to want to play because I think they're going to get a lot better come playoff time like there's talk about Kyrie Irving being available for home games again soon if um you know, restrictions ease up or whatever, which is crazy because he could have been available for home games the whole way, his thing to remember. Um, that was his choice. But, like, I, I do worry about what that means if they're having to play, like, a one of the, you know, Miami or something in the in the first round. That's, uh, that's dangerous. Whereas Memphis are likely to... I think they're going to probably finish second. I think the, the momentum that they've got, I think they can catch the... Where are they against the Warriors? I think they're a game and a half back on um, on the Warriors who are second currently. They're not going to catch Phoenix because Phoenix are too good. They're too far ahead. Um, but I think they can get that second seed, in which case they'd be playing a team from probably like, you know, Minnesota, Clippers, Lakers, New Orleans, um, one of those play-in type teams, which I think they could comfortably win that. So like I could see I could see the case in which like Brooklyn getting healthy again, they're gonna go on a run. They've got like a lot to make up for in terms of their last month. Memphis just full steam ahead on the train, like heaps of momentum. See, I could see them having like similar finishes to the season, but I think once you come to playoff time, I, I'm like Memphis for sure are, are in a better position because of the fact that they've put this together for such an extended amount of time. And I genuinely think they could go at least as, I mean, I'll, I'll be disappointed if they don't win a playoff series. I think they could reasonably go all the way to like the Western Conference Finals, in which case, if you're good enough to make it that far, you're good enough to go further, you know what I mean? So um, I'm, I'm all on board the Memphis Grizzlies bandwagon. I think the Nets, I would like to see them do well for Marxie's sake. 
Um, and just because they got a couple of amazing players that are just like thrilling to watch, Kevin Durant first and foremost. But I think they've done a lot of damage over the last month, which is going to be hard to make up for. Going to keep a lid on my uh, fizz at the prospect of like, Memphis Grizzlies in the NBA Finals and just what that might look like from an Aotearoa perspective. Your question, please. I mean, the ideal is Grizzlies versus Nets in the final, isn't it? But I don't know if we'll quite get that far. Uh, my question is, NRL starting in a, in a week or so, um, I just want to know which Kiwi NRL prospect you are going to be watching most closely. But if you get a, if you get a Grizzlies Nets final, then it's NBA Aotearoa. <laughs> no more association changing yeah, the name the national basketball Aotearoa that's what we're we're fucking taking over we're out here um there's a couple that have risen in recent weeks with the trial someone who always comes to mind and I just got a question like can you repeat the question quickly which Kiwi NRL prospect will you be watching closest? Who are you most exciting for? Who's who's got your you know fizz in the head of the new season? Now you didn't use this word intentionally, but it's an important word to me. You said prospect. Yes. So prospect in my imaginary Kiwi NRL situation means they haven't played NRL yet. So you know there's that, and then there's young NRL players. So mm. you know we don't like to celebrate gangsterism but if you're a prospect of a gang you're not quite there yet you know you got to do you got to keep doing the mahi to get fully broken in so if we're using the prospect term they haven't played nrl and someone who keeps coming to mind is dean mariner with the broncos um last year 2021 he was playing schoolboy footy for palm beach corumban he was you know a couple years before that he was back in auckland and he has had a rapid rise in the Australian system. Apparently, he was one of the fastest Broncos players over like 40 meters or just a short sprint, which is very impressive when you also consider that he's a not a small dude. Um, so he is getting a bit of buzz. And I think there is a decent chance that you will see Dean Mariner play for the Broncos this year, one year after, one year removed from leaving high school. Um, if not, he'll be a key figure I'll keep a close eye on in reserve grade. Another bloke is Isaac Matalavea Booth, who is a massive unit at the Gold Coast Titans. And it's just like his, his frame and his size could be interesting for the Titans with some of the other massive units they have. Uh, prospect also means Will War 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 Warbrook. The former All Black Sevens player who is now with the Melbourne Storm. And if we know anything about the Melbourne Storm, they do love a athletic outside back from rugby, from Aotearoa. And Will Warbrick is just the latest in a long line of uh, rugby union tall lads on the Melbourne Storm wing. He's one as well. And then also big it up to Josiah Katapani, who has quickly risen through the Rabbitohs ranks to be a contender to get some game time in the Rabbitohs NRL team as well. He's making a quick impression there. He's from Otara, went to Pakaranga College, um, played Warriors SG ball, and then was then picked up by the Rabbitohs. So he's one as well. But as far as pedigree and then what has, hap what has happened recently, I would say Dean Mariner is the pick of the bunch and he is someone to keep a close eye on moving through the season. Musical jam here, Wildcard. What do you got? I Just before we recorded, I was listening to, I was watching some test cricket and I was listening to um, the new Gang of Youths album, which is very good. Like those sort of, um, what do you call it? Like uh, anthemic kind of um, alternative rock, I suppose. Um, have you no. have you heard it? Do you know who I'm talking about? No, but I'm just checking. No relation to gangsterisms of what we're talking about here. Don't believe so. Um, Are you they, talking like indie rock type of not, you know, gang of views producing drill music? I have no idea what you're uh, getting at. So <laughs> do, gang like, of views, 
gang of yeah. views what they make like indie rock or something yes yes there they don't go. make gangster rap drill music no uh, in relation should be to misconstrued yeah in relation to gangster prospects no um right not there quite go. there is there is some like interesting relation type stuff with it because it's an australian band they're based in london now um but they're an aussie band and the the lead singer i can't remember what his name is but he's of um samoan and maori descent so there's you know distinct um there's there's like there's a and one of the songs on the album they do the the um the the hitangata poem he like recites it at one point in like a little interlude in the middle of the song it's, it's cool as actually um and it's like a deeply personal album about like i think his his father died recently and it's about like um you, you know going through some grief and then going like uh, reflecting upon his life his dad's life um, his dad had like other kids from other families is like some like connection with them there's a song called brothers which is about that um good ass album like i i i funnily enough found it recommended by like american sources but it's an album that will play very well to the uh to the kiwi audience i believe whereabouts in aotearoa are they originally from uh no idea uh, i don't think he's i don't think he's a uh, like technically a kiwi at all i think he Grew, was like born and grew up in Australia, but his dad did live here for a while. So some of his brothers are from here. And he, as I say, like he's part Maldi. So, you know, I think Melbourne, I think they're from Melbourne, but I'm not sure. Most, most bands are from Melbourne these days. And most of the good Australian music, for some reason, seems to come out of Melbourne. It seems to be one of their melting pot cities. Melting pot cities for hip hop. <laughs> Apart, like, big it up, south, Southern USA, like just, oh, like, southern hip-hop is the best hip-hop i'd say you know whether it's you want to go back in history outcast you know um ugk any of those dudes goody mob that is the foundation for me of like me learning about hip-hop so i do want to shout out southern hip-hop but new project from tf called blame cancer can not blame cancer blame kansas is a fascinating album because tf is from la and he's like loosely affiliated with schoolboy q you know some crippin in los angeles and whatnot he has made some music um as, like I, I have been tuned into some of his tracks over the years but this new blame kansas album features production from mefux and rock Marci marciano who have a distinctly east coast sound so Rock Marciano is an independent rapper, businessman, producer from New York. And he is like, his production is very much the stripped back, independent, alternative hip hop. And Mephux, spelled M-E-P-H-U-X, has done production for um, some of the Griselda Records members, as well as other New York ulti hip hoppers like flea lord and some of those cats as well who are super underground in the new york scene so you've got this tf dude who has a distinctly west coast flavor and he is rapping over production from a real gritty grimy independent underground new york perspective those two worlds when they collide i get musical joy and that's where you get with tf and blame kansas you get like obviously you're getting a lot of the same hip hoppy fringy gangster ideas presented but you're also getting some real polish especially from rock marciano and tf his growth over the years to get to this point where you can it's a bit like a it feels similar to like a freddie gibbs finally linking up with mad lib type of situation where the production is just a whole different stratosphere to what the rapper had traditionally been working with and then you get the joy then you get the beauty of that work so big it up to tf and his new project blame kansas there's also a new album from earth gang shout out southern hip-hop atl but a jid as well there um spillage village from atlanta earth gang i think their new project is ghetto gods maybe not my favorite collection of uh like dreamville songs but if you do want to be taken into a world where 
some of the ideas around the female dynamic in our modern world. I think Earth Gang do a great way of presenting that with how, you know, the, the trials and tribulations they face, their people face, as well as um, some reflection on how society is directing females all with a very funky sound all with lots of fun little hip-hop bits but there's a there, there are some really important undertones and messages through their new project ghetto gods that's what it, it's called so yeah shout out to southern hip-hop like whether it's earth gang or outcast similar vibes so and also shout out to west coast east coast loving as well with tf and blame kansas big it up to the niche cash and the variety show We'll get back to watching the uh, Black Caps chase a victory in the second test against South Africa, not fighting for a draw, working hard towards a victory, maybe. Maybe. We'll see how we maybe go. Maybe not. <laughs> Kia kaha, stay beautiful. Cheer, cheer.